Hello, my name is Jason Bagley. I'll be narrating this video. And in this video, I'll go over a recent paper from the Beard Lab that looks at the mechanisms of reactive oxygen species generation from an enzyme known as complex 1, which is an enzyme in the electron transport chain in mitochondria. This paper was published in the end of 2014 in the journal Free Radical Biology and Medicine, and it was funded in part through the Virtual Physiological Rat Project talk a little bit about what's known regarding free radical production by mitochondria. So here is a figure from Martin Brand's group that shows all the many possible sources of free radicals for mitochondria. And these sources can consist of enzymes in the TCA cycle, enzymes in the beta oxidation, or enzymes in the electron transport chain. But what we know Today is that the major sites of electron production, what we think we know, is that complex one and complex three of the electron transfer chain are the major sites of ROS production. But in order to understand how mitochondria produce ROS and when they produce ROS, we must understand the mechanisms of ROS production. And so in this video, I'm going to go over a paper that does just that, where we look at the mechanisms of ROS production in complex one. So what we have here is a ribbon diagram of complex one embedded in a lipid membrane. Complex one is also known as NADH glucuronyl oxidoreductase. And the biochemical equation that this enzyme catalyzes is shown above. So what this enzyme does is it oxidizes with NADH, takes those electrons to reduce quinone to form quinol. And quinol can then go on to participate in further in the electron transport chain. So what happens is that NADH binds to what's called the NADH oxidase site or the flavomononucleotide site, where it is oxidized and those electrons are passed one at a time down an iron sulfur chain where the ubiquinol is reduced to ubiquinol at what's called the quinone reductase site. So we know this enzyme can, we can produce reactive oxygen species, but the precise mechanisms are less clear. For example, we know that the NADH oxidase site and the quinone reductase site are the two most likely sites in the enzyme responsible for reactive oxygen species generation. And we can reflect that above in the modified biochemical equation where now this Factor N represents the fraction of electrons, in this case from NADH, that's used to reduce oxygen to form reactive oxygen species. And so what we don't know is what precise enzyme states or where the electron is at on the enzyme that can lead to reactive, reactive oxygen species. For example, is a fully reduced flavomononucleotide produced ROS, or is a flavosemiquinone responsible? Likewise, if the quinone reductase site is a semiquinone responsible, or is one of the iron sulfur clusters responsible? And so it's previously believed that, at least at the quinone reductase site, that the N2 iron sulfur cluster, which is this iron sulfur cluster shown right here, which is just adjacent to the ubiquinone binding site, was believed to be responsible for ROS production. But we determined through a, a modeling study that shows this is not likely to be a major source of ROS production. And so how can we answer some of these questions regarding ROS production in complex one? What we can do is we can construct a model that includes all the necessary biophysical and biochemical details so that we can faithfully simulate the enzyme kinetics and ROS production kinetics. And to do that, we construct what's called a state diagram. And in this case, the state diagram is shown below where these big circles represent various states of the enzyme. The numbers represent electrons on the complex that come from either NADH or QH2 if the reaction is running in reverse. And the arrows represent various pathways to and from each state. 
But what's important is to characterize these states as a set of substates. So for, what a substate is, is a state that characterizes the likely position of the electron and electrons on the complex. So what I mean by that is, take for example, the case of one electron on the complex. It can either exist or reside on the flavor mononucleotide as a flavor semiquinone, the N2 iron sulfur cluster, which is just adjacent to quinone reductase site, or on a quinone molecule that is a, that's a semiquinone. And what we can do is we can use a model to predict the most likely state or substate of this state shown here. And we can do that for any number of states that we have in the model. And the reason why this is important is because some of these substates can lead to a loss production and some do not. And so in this case, I'm showing you the important loss producing states that we found from the, the model study and the ones that were not important. And so now that we have a model, the next thing we want to do is we want to calibrate the model or fit it to some data. An example of that is shown here. So here's an example of kinetic, kinetic fits or kinetic simulations of the model fitting some data. Well, we're looking at the NADH oxidation rate as a function of NADH or Q, quinone or any, you know, any other combination of products and substrates. And you'll notice that the data, or the, you notice that the model can fit the data very well. And, and I should need to mention, this is just a small set of the data, sample of the data we used to fit for calibrate the model. I encourage you to look at the paper if you want to look at all of the, the data we used to calibrate or fit this model. So not only can we simulate the enzyme kinetics, with our model, we can also simulate the ROS kinetics, and that's shown here. We can, the model is able to characterize ROS production from the FMN or flavonoid site, as well as the semiquinone site or the quinone reductase site. And not only that, the model can simulate individual species of ROS production, whether it be hydrogen peroxide or, or superoxide. And they can do it in a range of conditions consisting of various concentrations of NADH or ratios of NAD to NADH. So now I'd like to go over sort of the global behavior of a model as we change all the model inputs. So these are some very busy slides. I will walk you through them. But to start, I want to, I want to draw your attention to the top right where we have the, the color legend where black indicates conditions of, of high products either QH2, quinol, or NAD. Blue is a condition where we have a lot of quinone and little everything else. Red is where we have a lot of NADH and little everything else. And purple represents the various combinations of these possibilities. Uh, each of these figures is plotting some output as a function. Or on one axis, we have the member tension. The other axis is the matrix pH. And the various combinations of products and substrates is captured by all the different colors that you see here at the, these points in this mesh. And this mesh is the average value of all these points in a given region. And so, for the figure on the top left, we see the stoichiometric coefficient. So, if you remember, if you don't remember that, that is the fraction of electrons that are that escape and are used to reduce oxygen point loss. And you see that under conditions where we have what's called FET or forward electron transport and RET or reverse electron transport. So FET is a condition where electrons from NADH are used to produce ROS. And RET is a pathological mode of ROS production where electrons from QH2 are used to produce ROS. So you'll notice that when the member potential is high and the matrix pH is high or alkaline, there's a predominance of RET occurring. The model predicts a lot of RET under these conditions. And that's important because it's been independently validated by Martin Brand's lab. 
So this, this lets us know that the model is, is doing what it's supposed to do. Right? It's able to predict the proper conditions where we have this pathological mode of loss production occur. Now on the bottom left, the plot of the NADH oxidation rate. And you'll notice again, uh, or you'll, you'll notice that high member potential and high pH, we have a net reversal, right? So this is where our RET is occurring. We have reversal of the, the, the reaction, and we get QH2 oxidation instead of NADH oxidation, which can lead to a lot of ROS, much more ROS than other conditions as shown by the figure on the right. And so what we can do though is we can actually look at, with the model, we can look at the individual contributions of ROS production of the potential sites of ROS production that I talked about earlier. And that's shown in this slide here. And on the top left, you'll see, so again here I'm showing matrix pH versus member potential. And here I'm plotting the semi-flavosemiquinone ROS production. This is the fully reduced flavin ROS production. Here is the fully reduced flavin hydrogen peroxide production. And this is the semiquinone superoxide production. And you'll notice that the flavin semiquinone produces next to no ROS under the conditions that we're simulating. In fact, the only way that this species, or this component of the enzyme, will produce ROS is if rotenone is included to inhibit the Q reductase. You also notice that the flavor mononucleotide, if we take these together, they sum up to about three fifths the total ROS production, indicating that the flavor mononucleotide is the major source of ROS production in this enzyme. However, the semiquinone makes up the other two fifths, and it can be a significant source of ROS production, in particular during wet conditions. So now I'd like to summarize this video with the following points. First, that the primary source of ROS is the flavor mononucleotide, but again, the semiconductor also plays an important role, in particular during reverse electron transport. Now, the second point is that the iron, N2 iron sulfur cluster does not produce ROS. So this was believed to be a potential site for ROS production, but during model development and analysis, we did not need to include this mode of ROS production to fit the data that claimed that this was the source of ROS. And the third point I didn't touch on in this video, so if you're interested, please read the paper, but the pumping mechanism proposed by Martin Brandt's group is both thermodynamically and kinetically feasible. However, what this does is it makes the parent KM for quinone hypersensitive to member potential. So this, what we can do is we can use this model to design a very interesting experiment to do, to test and, and see if is, is this mechanism of proton pumping true or not. And again, please read the paper if you're more interested in it. Now finally, the MATLAB codes of the model to, to simulate it and produce the figures that I've shown you, as well as the figures in the paper, in the supplement of the paper, are available at the Virtual RAT website, shown here. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send me an email. Um, I'd be happy to, to answer. And with that, thank you.